we find that if this world disappears from our awareness, another one opens up. We find that there is continuously an experience going on. We find that this conscious spirit, the consciousness which is experiencing, never stops experiencing. Either it experiences this or that. Therefore, we, we come to a possibility of its being immortal. But we don't know yet. Possibility is there because certainly when the kind of death takes place which we are seeing in hospital, and when we induce that kind of experience within this body, in consciousness, when we try to see if we became totally unconscious of the body with the same process of withdrawal of attention like we are seeing there, and we find that we are still fully conscious of experience, then we notice that the experiencer in us, the soul in us, the spirit in us does not die. Not with the body. Therefore, when we use the word death, we are relating it to the body alone. Now, this statement can only be made by somebody who is experimenting and should not be made of you. None of us should ever claim that the soul is immortal unless you are merely quoting and put it in quotes. Quotes. It's said in the scripture, it's said in that book, it's said by so and so, soul is immortal. I'm still finding out. And that's how one should put it. One should be able to claim the immortality of the soul when one has withdrawn the attention and found that even if one is unaware of the body, the experience never stops. The experience goes on beyond it. Then one can know that there is a continuity of experience, a continuity of awareness that one gets just by staying with awareness and not with the body. Mm -hmm. Then what happens? Then you live. Then we open our eyes. In eternity. And we find the body back. <laughs> and we re, re agitate the body into activity. And we find a strange source of power. We find that this physical universe was created from the very power which we were looking for. Mm. And very strange knowledge comes to us without asking any questions. Mm. Without anybody telling us. And that knowledge is, we created the world. We can't shut off that knowledge. But this knowledge has come by withdrawal of attention and finding out means to be alive and then re scattering the attention to the body and to the world and finding out how it operates. How the machine operates, how the drama operates, itself is an answer to our questions. When we have done that, you will find 99% of your questions which you have been wanting to get answered, get answered. There is nobody to answer. Very strange, very worthwhile experience. Therefore, dying while living is a very worthwhile experience. And if dying while living shows that you alone are real inside, and the physical universe is just an experience, what about all the others who are part of the experience? What is their reality? Are they also real? Is there only one real? Is there only one real? How come? We can gather together and talk of doing this, all of us doing this experiment. Who, who are the others? Who are, where are they coming from? That question also gets answered. Dying while living, when you find their essence, is also within you. And they are outside acting in a certain way because the essence is there. If that essence was not there, you wouldn't set up this pattern. Like you go to a moving theater, and want to see what happens on the screen. The, nothing is happening on the screen really. You are constantly looking at the screen. If somebody says, I am in search of truth. I don't want to see shadows. And he goes to a movie hall and turns his head toward the projector. Yes, I have come to see the real movie. People will call him. Uh, they say, Yagoku. <laughs> they are signing to the nut house for coming to the movie and turning his head away from the screen where all the show is taking place. 
He says, no, I found out the truth. The truth is, it's in the film, in the projector. And the operator can't change it. One guy from the village who had never seen a movie in India went to a, a movie hall and there was a little naughty scene. A <laughs> woman bathing in a, in a pool. But by the time she undresses, gets in the pool, a train comes. There's a train track in front of the pool. Train passes in front. So nobody can really see. Yeah. But one can imagine what must have happened when the train was passing. That guy went to that movie eight times hoping the train will be late one day. <laughs> <laughs> Little realizing the train cannot be late. Why not? What was his mistake? His mistake was he thought the train was actually going in front of him. The train was going on the celluloid strips in the projector. It was predetermined, fixed. You could run it any number of times. The train will always pass at that time. Now this knowledge, this knowledge that this world is being generated on that basis, a very great knowledge. It gives a clue to so many things. The determination, the nature of the pattern, how the film was shot, where it was shot, why it is like this, why are so many people being seen here, what is their reality, what is their essence, who are they? Everything comes to be known. It doesn't mean that after you come to know them, you would like to sit there. Nobody after knowing that projector is setting it, you still go to see a movie, you look at the screen. So even after this knowledge, when one comes back to the world <coughs> and opens one eyes, looks at the world, looks at the same world, with a difference. Now he can enjoy this world, be happy in this world, knowing what it is for, what it stands for, how it is designed. But there is a pattern. There is a purpose. There is something. Like that lady said in the show in the morning, she said she got a peep and found that there was a plan and it worked. And so she was tuning in with the plan. That's it. Which means that once you get this knowledge, you get to know how the whole plan of creation is set. And you can participate. Instead of fighting it and taking these things so real, and never realizing how they can be self-created. If I try to explain to a person, look, this is illusion. <laughs> Man, this body is illusion. The reality is somewhere up. Go to such kind. Go to some other place. He'll never do it. He may believe me. He may use it as a opiate. He may use it to, uh, to pacify his pain. But he cannot go anywhere. Because by trying to persuade a person to say, this is unreal. He says, if this is unreal, what is real? He knows no other reality. This is the only reality we know. And if we know the inner reality, how this outside illusion has been created, then this outside is still the reality to live with. But we live with a difference. It doesn't mean that we withdraw from here and go away. Just like we never give up from going to movies because we know they are not real. We go for fun. We pay a ticket. We go for a purpose. When we are willing to pay for the ticket and go and watch a show on the screen, we don't know if we pay the ticket to come here. Maybe it's a free show. Or maybe we pay price for it. But having come into this, we want to see it. But the difference between a person who knows that he's paid a ticket and is enjoying this show and a person who doesn't know is that the person who enjoys the show sits on his chair in the auditorium and watches the screen. The person who doesn't know runs and tries to stop what is happening there and tries to interfere and go into it and gets all messed up. He messes up the screen, messes up himself. Now if we come to have this awareness that this show has been set up for a certain purpose, we can sit quietly in the chair at the very spot, behind the eyes, at our third eye center, from where we are in any case seeing the whole show, <laughs> we are not seeing it from anywhere else. It's an awareness. When we are aware that we are watching this show from within, we can continue to watch it and enjoy it for the purpose for which it was created and do those things which belong to the action of this body. 
and participate in those things which belong to the action of other parties as required by the script, as required by the show to enjoy. This is true spiritual. I share with you today that I have learned from the great master, true spirituality is to follow the instructions the master gives to go with it. As a means of finding out our own self, as a means of finding out who we are, as a means of finding out why this whole system has been set up, why this whole experience and world has been set up. And having found that, in the company of that experience of truth or reality, whatever you find, in the company of that knowledge, to have a life pattern, a lifestyle in this world, in which you know precisely what you are to do and enjoy, you will notice, in case you do it, that we have been given a role to perform. When we open our eyes, after this knowledge, we find that we have been given a particular kind of body, male, female, certain age, this growth, certain experiences are going on. At any point, there is a certain role we have been given to perform in this body. And who gave that role to us? The designer of the whole plan. With whose will and plan we want to tune in. And therefore, if we play our role vigorously, efficiently, with full of life, we get the best out of this show. Therefore, a person who is a real seeker of spiritual truth does not become passive or inactive or run away from life. He is in fact the most active person. He faces life as a comes, And he performs his duties, function, role in this world more effectively than people who are non spirit Therefore, this particular way of looking at a person, he is in pursuit of his own self, therefore he doesn't know anything about the world. This is not the description of a spiritual seeker. The description of a spiritual seeker is he knows his role because he discovered the nature of the spirit. Because he discovered the plan which has taken place at spiritual level. Because he found out how this was created. He found out why it was created. Having found out, he has found out his role. And he is performing his role with such efficiency, with such vigor, with such enjoyment. It is no longer a task. It gives him pleasure and happiness all the time. That's the distance. Wherefore, real spiritual awareness gives a strange kind of happiness which is unmatched by any happiness coming from pleasure or pain. Because the happiness of awareness is a continuous one. It doesn't depend upon the immediate episode. Let me take an example. People in this country and perhaps around the world are very happy if they have a lot of money. If you have a million dollars and put it in your bank or put it in your locker or put it in your bag, the million dollars are not in front of you all the time. But it keeps you feeling high. <laughs> this is what is happening with local wealth here. <laughs> if you get this kind of wealth which seems to give happiness here and is not in front of you, is not being spent all the time, it's still there. It is just there. Now, why is it giving you happiness? Just the awareness of it. Just being aware it is there. Will make you happy. The same thing is true of spiritual wealth. When you discover that you know why it's going on, you know what's happening, even if it's not being used, that knowledge is not being used every moment, the fact that you know it all the time, that awareness makes you happy in a way nothing else can make you happy. Therefore, the lifestyle changes. The lifestyle of a person who has this spiritual awareness changes on the physical plane. It is not possible to see a person morose and unhappy over here and say, I am very sad because I am looking for my real home and going away from you. The person who is crying and unhappy here, that may be a starting point for him to start the experiment. Because people don't start. Looks like the designer put in a few nice cues for when people should become seekers. When he set up the whole show, 
and found that what are the kind of things that will make human beings as created in this plane, as in the physical world? What will put human beings into seeking of the truth? And sad to say, he found that when they are unhappy and full of pain, it triggers them of more into seeking than when they are getting the pleasures and joys of life. It's a strange but true. Most people had episodes that were not very pleasant. And they said, let us now take recourse to God. When things were fine and smooth here, they didn't bother about it. So, in the case of many people, initial sorrow, suffering, sadness, pain may have kicked off the seeking in them. But once they proceed through the seeking, and get even partial awareness. I'm not talking of full awareness. Even partial awareness of what this show is all about. By withdrawal of awareness to their own selves. When they get that awareness of what this show is about, they become so happy. They are bubbling. They are radiant. Their faces shine. And, and I liked one face in that show this morning. That woman who saw that beautiful meadow. And she said, that a, a, a person in, in a purple robe, he gave her, a, he, she couldn't name him, she didn't know the name, who it was, <laughs> Peter Paul or anything. But there was a being, spiritual being, who let her have a look into what is the reality of human beings in, inside. Human beings, what, what are they in reality? And she saw personally that in reality, they have pure love. And they, then they are covered up with all the rest of us. And she saw that, she can't get over it. And she never had that experience again. And that experience lasted one minute. It looked like 20 minutes. A one minute experience can make you a loving person for life. Yeah. One look at who you are can make you a loving person for life. That's the truth. And your whole face, your whole attitude, the whole way of dealing with people changes. One minute to two. Yeah. That's a great experience. If one minute can alter you so much, then this world doesn't become a place to run away from. It is to run away from that we find this truth. Having found the truth, this place becomes the heaven we were looking for. And the very happiness that we are trying to find by running away comes back to us in the very place from where we are trying to run away. Right. But this change in our awareness even of the physical universe, is one of the greatest gifts that we get by following the spiritual path. If somebody says, I feel very happy. Clarence showed me a little discourse written up in which that uh, nice uh, quote was there by the master which said, when you get happiness, you always get from himself. From within yourself. All happiness is within yourself. When you find happiness from somebody you think you are getting from outside from another person, you are getting that happiness from that person because that person is inside you. Otherwise you wouldn't get On that part, that the source of happiness is all inside. And one glimpse, one look at oneself can sustain a level of happiness which goes through this whole life. It's worthwhile. So I always share this with spiritual colleagues that if you really want to find what all the spiritual truth is about, first of all, shed all dogmas, superstitions, concepts, speculations, anticipations, because any one of these will hold you to itself. Shed all these. Be open and free. Go within and get what you can. That's a starting point. Once you have gone within and had that experience, come out and share with the world the strange love uh -huh. and happiness that you have got for yourself. This happens every time. So this is the real spiritual path. All this thought that I shared with you was triggered off by that show. Oprah Winfrey's show today. And I hope... Uh, you will find it useful in the meditation that you do in the attempt to go within that you make.
Any questions? Yes. Uh, in reading uh, one of the uh, books, uh, it talked about when you go in within, you should have a spiritual guide. Are we supposed to attempt to go within without a spiritual guide? No. The reason why a spiritual guide is recommended for going within is that if we do not have a spiritual guide outside in this physical world who also becomes our guide within, we can be misled by our mind. The mind pretends to be a guide and the mind for its survival wants us to be outside. You will notice that when we want to go in without a spiritual guide, then the mind takes up a position where it says, I can guide you quite well. After all, it's all one can think over it and one gets into the very speculations and dogmas and anticipation that I have been talking about. What is mind's method of guiding? How does mind or thoughts guide us? They guide us from concepts. First we build up a concept and then we say, that is we have to follow, this is what we will get. So that's the guidance of the mind. If we have no spiritual guide, we are misled and misguided by the mind. That is why it is recommended. If you want to go within, you must have a spiritual guide. Does a spiritual guide have to be with you at the time of meditation? No, the spiritual guide is the one from whom you get guidance, even if he is not there at the time of meditation. Once you have established a rapport and communication with a human being whom you can call your spiritual guide or a master, like we call a spiritual master as our spiritual guide. Living, living experience. It's, it's a living experience, not our mind an experience other than our own mind. And we can talk to that person, ask questions, get guidance. And then if something happens in the meditation and we are unable to associate with that guy, we can go back to him and say, this is what happened. He can then also say, well, this part of what happened was your mind and this part was indeed the guide himself. Yeah. After that, then once you begin to recognize the guide within, you don't need the physical bodily presence of the guide anymore, then the guide can operate within. Because then you have learned how to distinguish between the mind and the spiritual guide within. That's right, yeah. That takes a little while. After that, you only need the spiritual guide within, not out. Did you see the show this morning on 9 o'clock Oprah? Did yeah, you I was talking about That's the one I started with. That's the one I was talking That's, about. Yeah. I missed it by a few minutes because I was reading heaven on earth. But I said, well, I can be in two places at one time. But as soon as I got through, a telephone rang and said, you can write to know New York for a copy. So I'm going to get the copy. <coughs> because she's doing a tremendous job. And he, he has, he has, we have the tape. Yeah. You print the video tape? Yeah. Yes. He got a videotape made. Oh, that's good. That's Clarence. very good. Clarence got a video can, can you here. make it on tape, regular tape for me then? What I don't tape? have a video yet. No, he will show you on his video also. Oh, that's what I want to see. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Someday. Yeah. He will show you on his video. And and uh, there is the same thing in, in Austria. Do you know somebody in Austria? You know some spiritual person in Austria? What happened? They're going to have the same thing. And through experience of real, true spirituality, by nothing else but presence, the holy presence of recognizing the Holy Spirit. But I don't know anybody in Austria. My father came from that area, and he was in that army. But I don't know anybody. Uh, but I know where, when, it, when it's good, it's good. It's, it's that it. <laughs> That's it, you know. I would like to be there if I could go with somebody to, to check up on it like that. <laughs> what is the bottom line of spirituality or all our seeking? What are we really seeking? Could we put it in one word? Real happiness. Awareness of oneness. Real happiness. All right? that awareness awareness of gives us oneness. real happiness. Awareness gives us real happiness. Knowledge gives us real happiness. Going within gives us real happiness, really? not temporary. Yeah. And that is why we get real happiness, not 
not merely a egoistical blowing up of our own self saying, oh, I have the knowledge. That doesn't give happiness. No, I've seen ego. people, ego, that I've seen people who say, we have got this knowledge, we did this, we did that, their heads become so big, and then, and then they are very unhappy yeah. because they try to, to argue with people yeah. and the yeah. people don't accept what they're saying and they argue even more, then they become sad, then yeah. they become fretful, then they become angry, and do they become unhappy. Do it, do it, do it, so the do same it. knowledge makes them unhappy. Real happiness comes when you know and you real know. truth inside. Yeah. Any question? Any other question, comment? Yes. Does it make any sense for uh, a seeker, after the truth, to try to go inside and find the, the switch that they were given for this life? Is that, is that helpful in what living is, this life? What is helpful is to know there is a script. Right now we don't even know there is a script. Right now, one of the reasons for our misery is the feeling we can do it, oh, we didn't do it. We should have done it this way, not this way. The regrets, guilt, these are the things that are bothering us, they are punishing us for nothing. One lady, the same lady, I think in the morning show, in Oprah Winfrey show said, oh, one truth I was told was, there is no such thing as sin. If you think with the heart, not with the head. It was today. Sin is because of thinking with the head. It was today, today revealed today. at the satsang today because Mrs. Spess brought the whole show to satsang. Very and, good. And the other people said, you know, why, why she shot? Why she, she was so sure until she looked at me and both of us smiled together and they were all saying, gee, this is something wrong with this world if they're coming, bringing sat opera to satsang. You know, but it wasn't the, we're just talking about Oprah's oh, satsang. It was how we look at it inside. See, and she's trying so hard to do a wonderful job. She's very honest. She yeah. says her cousin Joe pops in and pops out all the time. <laughs> and she has been trying hard to get out. She can't do it. She's very honest about it. Yeah, she's yeah. honest. Yeah. But, but this is honesty and sincerity are very necessary. If you really want to get something out of it. Yes, you will. Can't do it on a light-hearted way. So one has to be sincere about it. Yeah. Uh, then one gets the real knowledge. This uh, knowledge about a plan, there is a will operating, and which is not the same will as our egoistic will that we have here. This knowledge itself makes for a lot of happiness. <laughs> Unless we have the experience, speculatively one might say, if one is an intellectual, says, how can a universal will give more happiness? That will crush our individuality. We should have individuality, we should have our own free will. If we come to discover we are all trapped in a universal will, in a universal plan, how can it give happiness? This is a concept, this is speculation. A speculation can make you unhappy before you have started. But if you do not speculate, and realize how much you are a part, a significant part, an essence of the universal will. Yeah. That's your will. And what is your role in terms of that will? When you actually experience, you become intensely happy. That is why a spiritual path is an experiential path and not a speculative path. You want to talk about the spiritual path, first go within. I don't think one can really share much on the spiritual path except by going with it. The real truth is go with it. Go with it means die while living. Die while living means put your attention in third eye center. Follow the instructions given at initiation and withdraw to the spot. This is wonderful. I said pain and pleasure can be Localize in one place. You will find the secret of the causation of pain and pleasure of that very area in consciousness from where we are operating. Third eye center. Right now, when we start as a beginner on this path, the beginning when we try to sit in a 
quiet meditation and try to be within ourselves and see what happens. It is very dry, unattractive. There is nothing to hold us. So the mind has a good, good time just driving us out. Because there is nothing sufficiently attractive to hold us there. But as we stay on longer and longer, the experience is there. We start holding us. It takes a while. It takes as much while as we are distracted now. If we are scattered and distracted, it takes longer. If we are not so much distracted and scattered, it takes less time. But when it becomes attractive and pleasurable inside, then the progress is much faster, much quicker. So some people get disheartened in the early stages of meditation by not being able to get that pleasurable, attractive sensations, attractive feelings which hold them there. They give up too soon. One should be. One should realize this is it. If we are made like that. We are scattered and distracted. Therefore, in the beginning, it is very dry and looks like an effort. Looks like we have really put in a lot of effort. That is why instruction number one is Put the maximum of your effort and attention. Put the maximum of your thinking, maximum of yourself at the third eye. And once it becomes attractive, the next instruction is let go of any effort. And just be withdrawn by the pull of your own being there, pull of your own presence. And the pull itself is so beautiful. That experience itself is great. And we call it Shabbat, we call it Holy Ghost, we call it Naam, we call it the sound current, we call it the attractiveness of the self, of the soul. That pull itself then picks up. You don't have to do anything. Similarly, we say, when you have not found out your spiritual guide, look for one. Get all your questions answered. Okay. Find a human being who can guide you outside. Find a living master. We say, you must find a living master. There is no way to do it. And once you found the living master and you have gone and established himself within by science which he has taught you how you can find out that that is not your mind but the master within, when you have learned that technique, it's no longer necessary. Just stay with the inside master. No physical master is necessary once you have established the inner form of the guy, of the Shabbat. That's his real form. That is the real form even of the master outside. So these instructions vary according to our own state. When we begin, we begin from where we are, with effort. And when we end, we end where we are, with love. And just a state of being. Yes, so you always put the blame on yourself. And I always said, my, is something wrong with my meditation? And yet, I wanted to know the definition of meditation from God within. But as a human being, I am wrong in meditation. Because I recognize my mind, mind is scattered, so I watch it. It's scattered here, a minute, two minutes here, three minutes here, a minute, and that, that's me. That's me. I did it. And until I recognize and put the blame on myself and get still and get to know that love is going to take care of it all. What kind of love? Ego love? Flesh love? Mental love? Educated love? Changeable love? All kinds of words love? Lazy love? I love? Rich love? Everything? That's mortal. Until I w hit the word divine love, then uh, I felt cool. And I felt <laughs> cool. I felt. I felt I didn't want to tell everybody that. I felt it's a sacred thing. And when I hear that there's no secrets, then I got scared. Why? Why? Why, I'm supposed to be keeping that secret. It's mine. It's all within me. Until you said there's no secrets in this world. There yes, are no it's secrets true. in the world, but we still have to keep some secrets. 
Yes. Yeah. Why you, do we have to keep secrets? That. You respect that. Why do we keep it. secrets when there are no secrets? <laughs> we keep secrets because in our effort, in our desire not to keep a secret, we boost our ego. Yeah. That becomes an obstacle. Obstacle. That yes. is why the masters say, if you happen to have an experience personally, yeah, which is beautiful which gives you insight into yourself, keep it to yourself and digest it for a while. Yes. Don't yes. run around. No. When no. you've just gathered a few cups, a few drops in your cup, don't show, I've got some and pour them all over yeah. and make the cup empty again. When you want to share with other people, let the cup fill up and overflow. Yeah. Then share with everyone. Then share, yeah. You're right. That is till then we keep a secret. The secret is used only to preserve something that may hurt us because the ego is so strong. Even if we get a little bit, we want to run and share and then destroy what we've got. Then we we'll lose it and then, Yes, and then the ego replaces that experience. So in order to overcome that, the masters say, digest what you get. Fill up your cup. Then you share. If somebody it says, I have a bucket of water and the whole city is on fire, you can't do anything. <laughs> better, better to wait and call the fire engine. Then say, no, I have got my bucket. What am I? I am going to come out first. You do nothing. So here people who have got nothing much in them, people with very little spirituality and spiritual experience, having a little bit of uh, verbal knowledge, learned a few nice words or read a few books, they want to run and say, we can tell you what is there. We'll quench, we'll, uh, we will uh, quench the fire, we will uh, put water on the fire of this world and cool it down. They are not even quenched the fire in their own hearts. First one should cool oneself. <laughs> and when one is sufficiently cool and has enough resources, come and help the whole world. There is a time. That is also another beautiful thought that came up, that there is a time for everyone. When you look at the plan by which this world is going, the will, the divine will, what you call the divine will, the will of the Lord, the will that sustains the pattern of creation, the will that sustains the pattern of our life, when you have a glimpse of that, you will also find that that will has been spelled out into a time frame. And there's a time for everything. And you cannot make it grow. You say, no, I am a greater secret. I must find today. It is just like saying, this tree is mine. It must blossom today. It doesn't. The leaves and the flowers grow on a tree. And so should love and spiritual knowledge grow. Love and spiritual knowledge should grow like leaves to a tree. Yes. So, so then, there isn't, there isn't really, I mean, it's all predetermined. There isn't any reason to really try it, in truth, it is all predetermined, right. but living where we are, it looks like we can do something about it. Okay. In truth, we cannot. Right. So, but so. We, since we feel we can, go ahead. Supposing one feels, if you are lucky, you found out that you can wait. Have patience. You are lucky. But then you can wait. In bliss, you can wait. <laughs> For the right time yeah. in happiness. But supposing you say, no, I wish I could do a little bit on my own. This is strange that somebody else has fixed up the time for me. As if you are separate from that somebody else. Then you must <laughs> do something. So long as this thought comes to you that you are separated from that will. So long as this feeling is there that you can make an effort. You must make it. That becomes your role. But if that feeling disappears and you find this is all his will, then you need not do anything. Then everything will happen automatically at the best possible time. People say they tune in. If people tune in. If people tune in to his will, everything will be right. I'm talking to myself. It's the will. It's the watching the will and let and let the. Uh, this is really you talking to me, I'm me, me, my soul, because. I let it stand still. 
And I know that it's there. But I'm nothing. I'm nothing, you know. I'm nobody. I'm just watching the soul. The Holy Spirit. Then the will. And then I cool off. And I don't do anything about it. When we find that we are more than the body, <coughs> when we find we are more than the body, we automatically become witnesses. When we think we are the body, we are no longer witnesses. We become the doers. The doers, uh-huh. This is the yeah. change. Yeah, yeah. The change takes place in us when we discover the awareness center within us. When we are at the awareness center and find that the body is merely our body, anybody else's body, is yeah. just to perform a role. Then we become witnesses. Till that stage of knowledge, we think we are the doers and we become the doers. Uh -huh. We start doing things ourselves. The ego. That's the ego, ego comes. That's it. That's the it. ego comes when we identify ourselves with one amongst the many. Uh -huh. When the ego is not there and we do not identify ourselves as one amongst the many, and we become identified with the spirit of the whole planet, whose will we are witnessing, then there is only one doer, the one who planned and the will. has the will. Yes, the will. That's a big change that takes place. In spiritual growth that comes. If God is willing. Beautiful. Any other question, yes, comment, answer? Tonight. You mentioned fire engines a few minutes ago, and it recalled something, a story that you had once said about why fire engines were painted red. Could you retell that story? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a nice story. Yeah. <laughs> a story I frequently use to tell how people use logic. Even grown-ups use it, but the story was designed for children, but grown-ups also enjoy it. Why are fire engines red? Fire engines are red because fire engines have four wheels and eight men. Four and eight <coughs> makes twelve. Twelve inches makes a foot. The foot is a ruler. And Queen Elizabeth is a ruler. But Queen Elizabeth is the largest ship that sails the seven seas. And seas have fish. And fish have fins. And the fins fought against the Russians. And the Russians are red. And the fire engines are only rushing around. Therefore, they are red. <laughs> You know it all by heart. I have to learn it. I have to learn it from my lectures. People like to hear that kind of stuff more than any reality. 